for your friends and colleagues who uh, are interested in the topic of elder care and who aren't able to be here this afternoon. Uh, this is part of the League of Women Voters Speakers Series. So we have these typically every Wednesday from 12 to 1, usually in this room. There are a few exceptions. We have some offered in the evenings and sometimes if speakers are visiting from out of town, we'll be doing them via Zoom or we'll have, uh, you know, have them at other venues. Uh, but uh, for today's session, let me, let me just uh, make a couple of announcements because I don't want anybody to get away before you know what's coming up. Uh, next week's session, that'll be on October 26th from 12 to 1, is going to be a Zoom meeting. So not in this room, not in this building, it's going to be Zoomed on your computers. And it will appear as an announcement in the daily news and other uh, offerings. Uh, as well as on the League of Women Voters Moscow website. The topic is Child Care in Moscow, Challenges and Opportunities. And the speaker that day will be Darla Amundsen, who is the Idaho Star's Lead Quality Child Care Consultant. Uh, this is also part of the League's uh, Poverty Series. And so those uh, elements are going to be integrated into our uh, updated poverty report that uh, we're working on now. Uh, the, there's going to be a flyer that you should be able to see around town. Those are usually posted in prominent locations. So keep an eye out for that and with a, along with the Zoom link. Are there any other announcements of upcoming meetings or topics of importance to us today? Okay, very good. Uh, without further ado then, today's speaker is Julia Parker. She's a certified gerontology nurse and administrator in senior living and consultant in elder care and dementia support. For the past decade, she has supported and taught elders, their families, and healthcare workers to understand the impacts of aging, dementia, and the healthcare system. Noting that the challenges of life for elders can be daunting, she reminds us that none of us has to face those challenges alone. Consistent with that approach, Julia's book, uh, uh, the title Navigating Elder Care, was published in 2021. She has lived and worked in Moscow for the past 22 years. In her early career, she taught and conducted social science research, including at the University of Idaho, where she and I met more than two decades ago. Julia is mother to nearly uh, four nearly grown children and a community volunteer for organizations such as Moscow Food Co-op, dementia support groups, and local public schools, among others. She was elected to Moscow City Council in November 2021. Julia sums up her wide-ranging but integrated efforts saying, quote, in all my volunteer and paid work, I try to be inclusive, lift others up, bring kindness and joy, and ensure that my work is high quality and contributes to the lives of others. Please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Dr. Julia Parker. Thank you so much. I was looking back and um, I first did, I started doing presentations on navigating elder care two and a half years ago. At, um, right before COVID started. So I actually haven't really done any presentations since COVID, so I'm, I'm back, I'm glad to be back. I'm just gonna start my timer um, since there's no uh, clock that I can see and I don't wanna um, keep you here forever. All right. Um, can you hear me or do I need to use the microphone? I'm not super loud. So. Okay. Use the microphone if you have one. Um, you want me to use the microphone? Okay. There it is. Better? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm not very loud. Okay. So uh, over um, 2020, I took all of the conversations that I was repeatedly, repeatedly having with families who were looking to move a loved one into long-term care, and I used them as a foundation to write a book. 
And so my book is to help people um, navigate elder care. Um, it's pretty complex. There are a lot of components to it, whether you're doing that for yourself or your neighbor or your um, parents or um, whomever. So um, how many people here want to live in long-term care? Nobody, okay, nobody. Well, that's not exactly surprising because 87% of people over 65 say, I do not wanna live in long-term care. So I wanna talk about all the things you can do to kind of reduce your time in long-term care or your loved one's time in long-term care. But we need to have a reality check. 70% of Americans over 65 will need some type of long-term assistance. 70%, so 70% of us did not raise our hands. Um, American women spend an average of three to four years in residential long-term care. American men spend an average of two to three years in long-term care because they die earlier, <laughs> not because they're you know more impressive. Um, the range of cost, I, I'm almost afraid to write it down because it's growing so quickly, but the range of costs for residential care is $5,000 to $9,000 per month. Um, and then I want to talk about something, I want you to learn this new phrase called acuity creep. So acuity is how sick somebody is, like at the hospital you have people who need lots of help, lots of medications, maybe they just came out of surgery, they are high acuity. And then you have somebody else at the hospital who maybe has pneumonia, they're lower acuity. So what's happening in the US healthcare system is called acuity creep. So people are sicker and they're being pushed down to lower levels of care. So the hospital version, you have more nurses, more doctors, more labs, more help. And then you push that level of care all the way down to something like assisted living, where you have on the job trained caregivers and maybe a nurse that's there a couple of times a week. Um, so what you're seeing is that sicker and sicker people are ending up in lower and lower levels of care. Does that make sense? Okay, that's called acuity creep, or people call it sicker and quicker, right? You go to the hospital, you're really sick, they get you out of there fast. Same thing has been happening now with nursing homes. You used to be able to stay a long time in a nursing home, now they're much more focused on rehab. Get you in, fix you up, get you to assisted living. So I, like I said before, nobody here raised their hand when, they, when I asked if they wanted to be in long-term care. So let's talk about more of a global view of care. And by global, I don't mean planet-wise, I mean a, a, a big picture view. These are all the kinds of care that you may get or your loved one may get. You might need simply help from a friend or a family member. You know, uh, your, your grandkids come over and clean out your gutters. Um, your niece and nephew come over and put up your Christmas tree. Little, little things that help you stay home. Um, you might need uh, your friends to share dinners with you put things in the freezer. Those are small things that friends can help with. Um, so then you have volunteer or paid in-home help. Volunteer help could be somebody from your church, uh, people that come visit, um, a group of um, Boy Scouts that come rake your leaves, things like that. Or you might just pay for it. You might hire somebody to do things that in the past you felt comfortable doing yourself. Next we have in-home nursing or nurse assistant care. So the titles of nurse and nursing assistant 
aren't always well understood by, by everyone. A nurse is a, a registered nurse or a licensed professional nurse. <clears throat> In Idaho, they both kind of operate the same. A licensed professional nurse usually has an associate's degree uh, with a little less education. Um, they might not be able to do like invasive procedures, but you're not gonna need those in the home anyway. And then a registered nurse usually has a bachelor's degree and they can do more tasks and they can also supervise other nurses. Um, a nurse assistant is somebody who has taken about a six week course and they have gone through clinicals where they worked in a facility and were overseen by someone and then they take a licensing test as well. Um, so when I say nurse, I mean like a registered nurse, a licensed nurse. And when I say nursing assistant, I mean a licensed certified nurse assistant. In Washington, they call them nurse assistant certified, just to be different. Um, other things you might, you, you might use in terms of lots of different kinds of care are community services like we have in this building. Um, you might look at community settings like a, uh, an apartment complex or something like that that has over 55 people, everyone's over 55. You might need an over 55 independent living facility, which means that you get meals and some activities and the layout is uh, accessible for people with disabilities um, and you might get emergency help if you need it. Uh, more help is found with assisted living. You have on-the-job trained caregivers um, and then you have on-the-job trained people dispensing medication. So not CNAs, not certified nursing assistant and not nurses people that are trained um, to do these things. And then you have nurse oversight in assisted living. Um, a subset of assisted living is memory care. And this has become more and more popular to kind of separate that population out that is unsafe on their own. Um, then we have adult homes, adult foster homes, and those are usually in someone's home in a neighborhood and they'll take care of a few people. They also have some nurse oversight. And then we have what lay people usually call nursing homes, but the, um, in, in the elder care industry, those are called skilled nursing facilities. Um, and the, the abbreviation for that or the nickname for that is SNMP. And so if you're in the hospital and somebody's talking about sending you to a SNP, they're talking about sending you to a nursing home. Um, and then you have hospice homes, so places that run basically on the assisted living model and take care of people at the end of life. So those are lots of different kinds of care. But here's my little outside the box uh, thinking. So let's think about, well, I don't like those options, right? I wanna do something different. Well, there are a lot of options out there to use. Uh, there are lots of new high-tech gadgets and monitors that help people stay in the home, especially if you have a loved one who maybe is at work all day, but you're home and they need to keep an eye on you. Maybe, you, maybe the person can't quite remember uh, what they need to do. There are now high-tech gadgets that help people monitor their loved ones, um, alert them if there's a fall, um, and there are even some, some very high-tech medication dispensers that ding and tell you when to take your medication and pop it out for you, and they'll even text your kids if you haven't taken it. Um, so, you know, kind of invasive, but, um, and some of them are, are expensive. Like I think this uh, medication monitor is about $1,200. However, that's, that's a week in assisted living, right? So sometimes it makes sense to, to invest in those high-tech things. 
alternative living arrangements. Um, so, you know, we all want to live in the Golden Girls house. If you know somebody in California with a multi-million dollar house and you, they'll let you live there, then that's great. Um, you can support each other. Um, we have a lot of mother-in-law apartments or in-law apartments now in Moscow. That's become a growing area of um, development. Uh, so a little, little home on your loved one's property. Um, and then multi-generational living has become very popular and it, uh, you'll see lots of news programs on it. Like, oh, here's a place in Copenhagen where university students live in a senior living facility and they all get along and they support each other and provide socialization. So that's another option, but also just renting out one of your rooms to a college student in exchange for meals or taking you to grocery or you know, doing yard work or things like that. Average in Moscow, average occupancy in homes is 2.25 people, but most of our homes are designed for a lot more people than that. Um, and then my favorite, cruises and resort life. We can all dream, right? Um, <laughs> I, this is really becoming a thing over the last 15 years and I know COVID, you know, didn't help the situation, but living on a cruise ship can be about $5,000 a month, which is about the same as a low level assisted living. You know, it's an interesting idea. There's some articles about people who hotel hop um, and you get so many points that you end up staying for about $50 a night. It's pretty good you still get housekeeping, you get breakfast, you get uh, people to fix your room. It's handicap accessible. We can always think outside the box, right? Um, I actually had friends, a retired professor who uh, taught sociology and he worked, after retirement, he worked for a cruise line and he did lectures for them. And so he went for free. It's always an, another option. So why do people end up needing help? Um, well, lots of reasons, but these are the main, these are the main systems that we look at that are gonna betray us <laughs> and make us end up needing help. Uh, our cardiac system. So if you have heart problems, and I would even say cardiorespiratory, so heart and lung problems, they affect your endurance. And so you, as that increases, it may affect your endurance so much that you can't get around inside your house. Um, and so uh, that can cause issues. You might not have the strength to get up if you fall, if you have cardiac issues. Um, musculoskeletal, so we have decreased joint mobility that causes problems with us getting around our own homes. Um, we have pain in our joints, especially. Um, osteopenia, which means when your, your bones become frail and brittle and can break. And um, decreased muscle mass. So all those things make it harder for you to stay in a normal residential home. Um, our senses, using the microphone, right? <laughs> our hearing declines as we get older. Our vision gets worse as we get older. Even our taste and our sense of smell and our sense of touch decline as we get older. Um, and that can create hazards for people, whether that's driving or um, being able to navigate electronics because we can't see them. Right now I'm dealing with my almost 80 year old mother who I get these text messages from and I think, what? But it's, it's because she can't see. So, well, you know, you can figure it out if you want. Um, gastrointestinal and gastro and uh, genital urinary issue, issues. Uh, you have decreased appetite, irritable bowel, incontinence. 
Incontinence is a really common cause for people ending up in senior care because uh, families don't want to deal with it at home. Um, and then neurological issues. As people age, everybody's cognition slows down, but dementia is not normal. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that, that difference. We all process more slowly as we get older, but having dementia is different. So that, that's a brain disease, um, even though it's, it's not that uncommon. And then depression, not only does our cognition slow down, but it's not uncommon for the chemicals in your brain to be affected and for people to have more depression. But again, let's, let's think about this. So do we have to just say, well, I'm older, I'm breaking down, I give up. There are a lot of ways to fight against the more morbidity, the illness. So you, as we get older, we want to decrease the number of years that we're unwell, even if we want to increase our lifespan. So, so we don't want to live to 105 if 30 of those years are terrible, right? We want to increase our healthy years. So these are all ways to increase your healthy years. Move your body 150 minutes a week or more. Um, I think Michael Pollan, the author, uh, has the best nutrition advice. You know, you can read a lot of things about different diets. This is my favorite nutrition advice. Eat real food, not too much, mostly plants. That's about it. You know, if you can stick to that, you'll do better in terms of your health. Um, staying hydrated. Um, Dehydration can cause big problems with people as they age. Um, it can cause your blood pressure to drop. You don't feel well. It causes headaches. Um, makes your muscles makes it harder for your muscles to move, and um, also messes up your whole bladder. So don't don't dehydrate yourself. Um, social engagement. People who continue to be socially engaged is as they age, do much better and stay out of long-term care longer. And then cognitive stimulation, whatever that means to you. Doing Sudoku, talking to other people, reading the newspaper, going to church, going to a lecture, any of those things. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to teach yourself physics, right? You just have to keep your brain active. In fact, I, I wish I could find it, but there was a small study that showed that conversing with someone else was like three to five times a week was as effective as the um, Alzheimer drug Aricept. So, I mean, that's, the, that's, I'd much rather just talk to somebody than be on Alzheimer's drugs. All right, the cheapest things you can do to, for, in, in your later years or with your loved one is change your environment. Um, that means get rid of those throw rugs, fix that step, keep yourself from falling. If you have a really high bed, you know, fix your bed, get a reasonable bed. Um, if you have a slippery shower, fix your shower. It's so much cheaper. I know you're like, oh, remodeling the bathroom is tens of thousands of dollars. But yeah, that's three months in a nursing home, right? It's really important to try to invest in your environment if you can to make it as safe as you can to stay there longer. And if that means moving your bedroom to the main floor or moving your washer and dryer to the main floor so you're not going up and down the basement stairs, then those things are really, really valuable for, for um, maintaining your well-being at home. The cheapest help is with friends and family and volunteers. So don't be afraid to ask your, your neighbor to take you to the grocery store. Or don't be afraid to reach out to your parents and, and offer them help. 
um, if you feel like they're struggling. Um, and we're going to talk about making a specific plan in a little bit. And then roommates are also a really cheap way to get social interaction, cognitive interaction, and a little bit of help with day-to-day -day things, especially in these college towns. Um, and, and we have such a, a housing crisis. I think if I put on my city council hat, I'm like, please, please let a college student live in one of your bedrooms. Um, I, here's a little factoid. So I love the Golden Girls. I don't know about you guys, but you know, they're funny. So do you know how old they were supposed to be? Does anybody know? I actually wrote it down because I had heard this. All right, uh, what's her name? The grandma. She was supposed to be 79 when the show started. That's reasonable, right? B. Arthur was supposed to be 53, two years younger than me. <laughs> uh, Blanche, Blanche, right, that's Blanche. 47, and Betty White was supposed to be 55. So, I don't know how they, like, how do you retire and live with your girlfriends at 47? That would have been fun. All right. So, let's go beyond just fixing your home and, have, and, and living with your college roommate, right? Um, let's talk about cheap and free community programs that are available for people um, who need help. So the first one is transportation, because one of the hardest things to do as we age and if we have deficits is drive. And of course, our culture is really set up for all of us to have to drive everywhere. So these are services that are available in the area. Dial ride, which you can get local rides in the Moscow Pullman area. You just have to set it up 24 hours in advance. Coast. You can get regional rides. So even people that say need to go to Spokane to the cardiologist can use Coast. Um, and then there's Smart Transit locally. The bus, it just goes on a certain route. Not as convenient for people with mobility issues, but not, not terrible. And then of course there's Pullman trans Transit. Um, meals, right here in this building, we have friendly neighbors. They provide excellent meals. I know the cook. <laughs> they provide, they'll, they'll let you take home extra food. A lot of people bring their Tupperware when they come to Friendly Neighbors and they, they eat what they can for lunch and then they fill up for later. Um, friend, uh, the Friendly Neighbors program also runs Meals on Wheels in Moscow, in Pullman. Um, they have meals on wheels and it's all cooked by the Bishop Place um, staff. So uh, same, same food as they get at Bishop Place Assisted Living, um, where full disclosure, I still work a few hours a week. Um, and the Pullman Senior Center also has meals. Meals are an opportunity not just to get nutritious food, but for people to socialize. And so it's a, it's a great resource to have them. Senior Center, again, right here in this building is Moscow Senior Center. Pullman has a Senior Center. And almost all our little communities, Deary, Kendrick, Potlatch, Troy's is closed, but have these little tiny Senior Centers for people to get together. And so if you have a loved one who just, they just need more socialization, they're just depressed, they, they just need more time with somebody else, these are great options, um, and, they're, and they're very cheap. All right, I put the big dollar sign on these slides because I know that's all, that's what everybody wants to know. Like, who are we gonna pay for this, right? So I just put it there as like, yes, I'm gonna talk about it later. Um, In-home care. There are different kinds of in-home care. So let's say you're still not going, right? Your mom is still not going to the nursing home, absolutely not. So you can get different kinds of in-home care. You can get help with personal care, your body, 
and what people will call those in the industry, if you talk to a social worker or something, is activities of daily living. Have you guys heard that? ADLs. She needs help with her ADLs. That means taking care of my own body, showering, going to the toilet, getting dressed, things like that. So you can hire somebody to do help with ADLs, or you can just help have them, like I said before, help with meals, help with cleaning, things like that. Another kind of in-home care requires a physician or a healthcare provider order, so a nurse practitioner. And that is when you have an actual real nurse come in or a physical therapist, occupational therapy, speech therapy, come into the home and help you. And you have to qualify for that and your doctor or nurse practitioner has to order it or the hospital. And then there's also in-home care that is respite for loved ones. So if you are taking care of a loved one and you are burned out because people get burned out when they're taking care of their loved ones, you can get in-home care to help give you a break. And that's a great thing to do. It's, it's good for the caregiver and it is good for the person that needs care because a burned out caregiver is, is not the best care usually. All right, we talked a little bit about the, at the beginning of the, all the different things you could do, but I just wanted to reiterate residential levels of care. So you are moving out of your own home to someplace else. And these are what they look like in order of more care. Independent living and senior living. You don't get a nurse to come, nobody comes to visit you to check your blood pressure. Um, you might get meals and activities and you usually get emergency assistance, meaning you have an emergency pull cord. And that around here you can get at Good Samaritan in some of their um, cottages or in their apartments. Um, you can get that at Bishop Place in Pullman and at Regency in Pullman. Those are the places that provide independent living. Assisted living, um, you have nursing oversight. So kind of the nurses are running the show in assisted living. Um, but we talked about acuity creep. So acuity creep kind of goes both ways because more and more assisted living companies are pushing to get fewer nurses in the buildings. Why? Money. Because we're expensive, right? Yeah, we, we cost too much. And assisted livings are almost all for profit. Um, so you have nursing oversight and then you have on the job trained caregivers. And I just wanna be realistic about this. I just want people to know, I'm not trying to talk badly about assisted living, but you can go from working to, for, at Taco Bell to giving somebody's cardiac medications in a week, right? And you're basically making the same amount of money. Assisted living is very unregulated. Um, assisted living will usually provide meals and activities. Um, memory care is a subset of assisted living with some important aspects of it. It also has nursing oversight, just like assisted living. You have on the job trained caregivers. In most states, there's a little bit extra uh, a training that people in memory care have to do because it's it's an art. Um, you have a locked facility and I say locked but it's really delayed egress just like there's probably a door in this building. You push on it, it doesn't open for 15 seconds and then it opens and alarms to let everybody know that you opened it because we can't lock people in a building unless they're in jail, right? It's, it's not okay. So delayed egress buildings, and then emphasis on appropriate activities for people with dementia and uh, appropriate meals for people with dementia. People with dementia live in independent living. They live at home, they live in assisted living. 
but at the point where somebody is not safe on their own, like in their apartment or in their room, or at the point where they cannot advocate for themselves. They cannot say, you forgot to give me lunch, or I don't think these are the right medications, then they need to move to memory care. All right, to a couple more levels in terms of uh, the, the, the kinds of care you get. The next one, we talked about this nursing homes, we call skilled nursing facilities or SNFs. Skilled nursing facilities have physician oversight. So there is a physician associated with that facility. They might not be there all the time, but they do provide oversight. Um, nurses are at skilled nursing facilities 24 seven. So there's always a nurse in that building. And then they have certified nursing assistants. So not on the job trained, but the ones that actually take the classes and get and take the exam. Um, but nursing homes have changed. So it used to be that nursing homes, you went to the nursing home, you lived at the nursing home for however long it took until you passed away. But now they're really focused on rehabilitation. So now they'll either have a separate wing or be totally rehabilitation. And that means they are there for people who leave the hospital but can't go home yet. So that might be recovering from a broken hip. That's probably the most common one. You fall, you break your hip, you get surgery, you get to stay at the hospital for three whole days, and then you go to skilled nursing for four to 12 weeks while you get daily therapy until you're better enough to move on. Or if you don't move, make process, they still have you leave because Medicare won't keep paying for it. And they'll send you to another level of care. And then the last one we have uh, uh, more and more of in this area is they're called swing beds, which is a funny name, but all that means is it's a bed at the hospital just like at Gritman or at Pullman Hospital or Colfax, Whitman Hospital. And um, they are designed both to meet the needs of the population that needs um, long-term care, but also to help rural hospitals make enough money to stay in business. And so it's basically like a nursing home bed within the hospital. All right, a couple, a couple more types that are in the area. Uh, group family homes. I'm sorry, I should have said skilled nursing facilities in this area are Avalon in Pullman, Aspen Park in Moscow, Good Sam in Moscow. Uh, and then you have Whitman Health and Re Rehab in Colfax. Um, group family homes and adult foster homes, we talked about a little bit. These are individuals homes usually, they look like a home. They have from one to six adults. They have nursing oversight, but they're not there. They just come in maybe once a week. Um, uh, more common in Pullman than in Moscow because for whatever reason, it's easier to start a group home in Washington. Um, hospice homes, we don't have any of these in this area. Friends of Hospice started one, right before the pandemic and they couldn't keep it uh, open. Um, and then geriatric psychiatric facilities, not fun for anybody really, uh, but if you have a loved one who has psychiatric problems and now they're aged and have psychiatric problems, there are special facilities for people in that situation. Or if someone brain is deteriorating so much or in such a way that they become a danger to themselves and others, they may end up in a geriatric psych facility, at least for a while. Um, and the one we have available in this area is in Tico. Um, if your loved one ends up in a geriatric psychiatric facility, try to make it temporary. They don't have to be there forever. Like they need to adjust their medications and, 
and go someplace nicer. Tico used, used to have a terrible reputation, but it's gotten so much better, I have to say. Um, so it's used to be really scary to have to go to Tico, but um, it's, it really has gotten better. All right, the big question, the thing that everybody wants to know is, well, who's gonna pay for all this care, right? Um, well, that is the big question. Um, in the United States, we have two different things that sound the same, but are really different. Medicare and Medicaid. People get them confused a lot. Medicare is really a federal program. And this is how I remember them. Medicare ends with E for elderly. Um, Medicaid ends with D for destitute. Sometimes if you are old and poor, then you qualify for Medicare and Medicaid. Um, Medicare is like health insurance. It's kind of like Blue Cross, right? They pay for medical treatment. They will pay for rehab services at a skilled nursing facility. And that is it. They will not pay for assisted living. They won't pay for a group home. They won't pay for you to live in a nursing home forever. They'll pay for your rehab. Um, Medicare Advantage, which I am not an insurance person. You can, you do this part. Medicare no, Advantage. Is, yeah, <laughs> I thought you might get it through. Uh, Medicare Advantage are these programs that you can now buy kind of private insurance instead of using the federal program. I am not an insurance specialist, but I did find out at a recent conference that people who have those Medicare Advantage programs are really getting shuttled out of nursing home care because Medicare Advantage is for are for profit agencies that are selling you Medicare insurance and they're really trying to save money. And so people with the Medicare Advantage programs are not getting the long term care resources that people with other Medicare are. Medicaid, like I said, is for people who don't have money. Um, and uh, it varies from state to state, so that makes it more confusing. Um, they will pay for uh, medical care. They will pay for skilled nursing. They will pay for assisted living. Um, so Medicaid is that uh, safety net that will pay for some of these services if people have no money. However, Medicaid beds are limited. So not all facilities will take Medicaid patients. And in Washington, assisted livings have to carve out a certain number of beds that they will take Medicaid patients for. So they have to reserve a certain portion of their facility. In Idaho, there's no such rule. And so um, they don't have to take people that have Medicaid. And in fact, they can kick you out if you run out of money. So um, health insurance, it's not gonna pay for any of this. Nope, nothing. You're not gonna get anything from your health insurance to pay for long-term care. Long-term care insurance, some people were lucky enough to buy into long-term care insurance. It's expensive, you pay for it for years, and then you can use that to pay for all or part of your care. Um, it's become harder and harder to get and more and more expensive because the people that provide and sell long-term care insurance have realized that they were losing a lot of money. Um, and so usually the ones you, you can get now limit you to two years of, of um, of care. Um, and then Washington in the past year has created this long-term care fund. They're the first state to do this. It's kind of like when you look at your paycheck and you've paid into um, 
workers' comp and things like that. So it comes out of people's paycheck and it'll be available for people who have started to pay into it beginning in 2026. And the maximum amount is 36,000 and something, it's, you know, but $36,000, which we know will pay for not very much. Oh good, we're almost done. Other things that might help you pay for long-term care are the VA, if you're a veteran or you're married to a veteran, and then the rest of it is out of your own pocket. So. Um, it's really important that you, you plan. I know nobody wanted to go to long-term care, right? But it's really important that you plan you make a plan for what you might need because when it's a crisis, you're, you're not gonna be able to make a good decision. Your loved ones are in crisis. Everybody's having a crisis. Um, and so, except that you'll likely need care at some point, make a plan to, to prevent that crisis decision making. Um, Look at a list of potential needs for yourself or your loved one and try to figure out how they can be met. And I have some resources for you to do that. Consider the finances of it and, and what resources you might have. People often forget that they do get those VA benefits, especially if they're just the spouse of a veteran, um, but those are available. And be flexible and make sure that you are willing to change things over time. So you might remodel your house this year and live there for five more years, but then you, you might still need care later. So you, you have to, to not get stuck at one place. All right, here is my contact information. Um, I'm happy to talk to people. I, I also, you know, full disclosure, do this for a living, so. <laughs> um, but I do have full, uh, I do have resources on my website that you can download and use. And those are tools to assess needs and who's gonna fill that need. So you might sit down with, say my, say my mom needs help. I might sit down with my parents and my sister and my nieces and nephew and say, this is what mom needs. Who's gonna make dinners? Who's gonna mow her lawn? who's going to come over and give her a shower twice a week. You know, so those, those are really good ways to figure out how you can get people to help you. And you can download them, like I said, on my website. Um, the website also has um, tools for medication management, tools for going to the doctor. And you know, you go to the doctor and you forget what you're gonna ask and you get 11 minutes in there. And, you know. So it, tools for like writing that down, taking notes, making sure you're efficient in your doctor's appointment, um, all that kind of stuff. And my book's available at, um, at Book People or on Amazon. And I'm actually just about to go over and drop off a copy at the library. So you can always uh, check it out there too. Okay, questions? First, let's um, thank Julia for her presentation. Yeah. Julia, I'll let you keep the microphone in case oh, we do have some sure. questions out here. Uh, anybody? <laughs> Sorry. Well, I understand that uh, the only the shower part is only to be left in. Too close. So, once a week. So that's what the Uh, so your question's about what's kind of the standard for how many times you go shower? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't shower every day. It's no. Like once a week. Uh, I would say twice. Twice, twice a week, week um, is the pretty is pretty standard for how many showers you get with your package. If you're in assisted living, everything is negotiable. So you rent your apartment, and then you say, "I want three showers a week," and they say. 
to ching, to ching, to ching, and then you say, I take medication twice a day, and they say, to ching, to ching, and then, you know, so every little thing is a fee. Um, and so, but if you're on Medicaid, you're gonna get two showers a week. Is there anyone in place around here that has the three levels besides Good Samaritan and Bishop Place? Uh, Good Samaritan has independent living, assisted living, and skilled nursing. Mm -hmm. um, Bishop Place and Regency have independent living, assisted living, and memory care. So they don't have skilled nursing. Oh, they don't have skilled nursing. Um, and then Avalon and Aspen Park are just skilled nursing. It's really nice if you can get into a facility that has multiple, if you have somebody go to a facility with multiple levels of care, because if they get sick, they can just move down the hall, move back. You know, there's just different. It's more flexible. You mentioned the Washington State long-term care. Um, my understanding is that was put on hold because of a lot of pushback, particularly from companies like locally, Schweitzer, um, and companies that have employees outside the state of Washington saying these employees are going to pay into them, but they're not going to get the benefit. I think how that came down was you can opt out of it if you have, if, because I live in Washington, I, uh, or sorry, Washington. Oh, sorry. He was asking me about the long-term care um, insurance, state insurance in Washington, and he thought that it had gone away. But I, I think what they did was they provided more freedom to opt out. So I worked in Washington but lived in Idaho, so I opted out because I was never going to get the benefit. Um, and I think, I think that's how they solved some of that. But I, I could be wrong. Well, you may be right about that. It just makes me wonder. I know they've been talking about doing that because um, they were, well, you legislators were having second thoughts about having passed it. But how viable is that going to be with so many people opting out? Um, you have to have a reason to opt out. Like you already have a long term care insurance plan, or like me, I live in Idaho, so I opted out. But I, I don't know how viable. It's, it's not a very good program. Let's face it, it's $36,000 and people are gonna burn through that fast. But it is the only program. Like, I, I think my next book is gonna be about um, the, the coming crisis in long-term care. I, there is no way I would, I would be able to live where I have worked for my career. Um, I just don't have that much income. But you didn't mention, though, one of the things that many of us have is you have your house. Yes. You sell your house, and your house becomes the dollars that be the next step. Yep. That's what most people do. They sell their house and use that to pay for their long-term care. Um, and then there's, like, reverse mortgages and all that. I don't, none of that advice is coming from me. I don't understand all that. And there's, and when one spouse, there, there are also provisions if one spouse has to go into care and the other house, the other spouse can stay in the house without losing the house. But, but that's definitely not my area of expertise. Yeah. Okay, here's one for you. I would think that you've gone through this with clients. <laughs> What about when you're caring for a loved one and how do you keep siblings, children from fighting and even possible estrangement yeah. because they don't agree with what you're doing? I yeah. see that all yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. um, and all I can say is to keep communicating. Um, and like use some of the forms on my website to kind of divide up tasks. Um, and there are, there are sections in my book about 
that kind of conflict, especially if you're the local person, you're taking care of your mom, you know what's going on. There are two issues. One, you forget to tell everybody how bad she's gotten because this is just your normal day. And two, you have the, the sibling that flies in and they say, oh my gosh, this is terrible. We have to change everything. What are you doing? So I always tell people, don't be that sibling. <laughs> don't be that person that flies in and, and freaks out and then flies home. You know, because uh, I've seen some really terrible outcomes from that. And the poor, the poor person that needs care is just getting jerked around all over the place. So it can be really hard, and I'm sorry that you have to deal with it. Yeah, it's not me, it's oh, just my sister. Yeah. My husband and yeah. All the kids, and it's, it's awful. I would say group emails, you know, oh. just trying to get everybody to understand everything that's happening. Um, but we all have different ideas about what is quality of life and how long should somebody live and um, those are so individualized. It's really hard to come to agreement. Julia, you mentioned uh, all the high-tech gadgets and monitors available to help people mm -hmm. age in place to stay in their homes. <clears throat> we have a, uh, an elderly neighbor who is uh, aging in place and she told me yesterday that she had had a fall recently and she pushed the little button on her, you know, necklace or whatever it was to call for help. Uh, the people eventually answered and they didn't know who to send and it took quite a long time for anyone to get there and even when they arrived, they didn't know what to do. So she was uninjured from the fall, uh -huh. she just couldn't get up. And eventually she crawled across the living room floor, hoisted herself up on a chair and was standing by the time this fellow came. So my question, I guess, is who other than the Federal Communications Commission oversees these emergency response things that are being marketed so uh, actively on television and in magazines? No one. Um, but I, I would say, like, I've seen people do this and I think it's just about as good. And that is to get a pouch for your cell phone and just wear it around your neck, right? I mean, yeah, you look dorky, but, um, but you know, you can, you can, if you know how to call 911 on your phone, then you, you cut out that whole middleman um, situation. There are also you know, app, crazy Apple Watch functions now. Does anybody have one that tells them that they've fallen? I have a friend who did, and it did the exact, she fell, and it, they told her, they called her right away, and then she answered and said, no, no, I'm okay, I did fall, but I'm but fine. She, that's good, that's what you want, right? My brother-in-law has one, and he has kind of a wonky ankle, and it kind of, you know, twists it once in a while, and it'll say, you fell, and he's like, I did not fall, stop it. <laughs> but, um, Better safe than sorry, I guess. But I do like the, the cell phone around the neck version of that. Um, if the elderly person will use the cell phone. Yeah, that's yeah. The that's the other thing is, it's, I don't know the numbers, but people that, um, people that have those devices where they can call for help, it's a pretty large percent of, percentage of them who will not use it because they're embarrassed. And so, uh, yeah. Well, we're top of the hour here, but uh, I would imagine Julia is gonna pack up her computer and might have a minute or two to respond privately if you have additional questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we are so, please join me in thanking her again for this uh, terrific time. <laughs>